Good afternoon, scholars. Welcome to your Thursday Vista Virtual uh, Literature class. Um, today we're going to get into like a, a really important section of the book. Um, uh, before we do so, I wanted to give some quick shout outs to uh, some scholars who are getting on board um, and did great work yesterday. Isaac Leva, Adrian, and Aaliyah. Um, great effort way to knock out both your math and and your uh literature assignments um i i hope you did your lexia um but um i just also wanted to remind um everybody that um this is this this is our schoolwork this stuff's not optional um and if you are turning in if you are missing work or if you're turning in stuff blank or with just one or two sentences when it expects more um, that you're going to be making this stuff up in the fall when we come back. So um, that's going to be extra homework for you. That's going to be um, no club time until you get your, your work made up. Um, it's going to be no team time until you get your work made up. So um, students who are using this time as like a kind of a vacation, you're kind of in for a rude awakening when we come back in August. Um, so if you, but if you are a student like Isaac who, who just got on board, I want you to work on um, your new assignments. Don't go all the way back to the beginning because we know um, some people had a hard time getting a Chromebook or internet earlier on. That's fine, but just um, work on your most recent assignments that are the, to make sure you're with us right now, okay? All right, take a second right now to make my window smaller and pull up the work that you turned in and re returned to you with a grade so that you can compare the answers I'm going to go over with the ones that you turned in. Again, um, we're really grading pretty lightly. Um, we're putting way more points towards you doing your best instead of you, you having everything perfect and right. So if you get less than a 70 on a, vir a virtual assignment, that means you're not you're not even coming close to doing your best. So any assignments that are less than 70, you can bet you're gonna get it again um, to redo whenever we come back to school in the fall. So um, just know that, okay? And if there's anyone on your team or friends that, that need to know that, make sure that you make them aware. All right, let's check our work. Um, there's our turn-in rate. We're a little bit up from the day, which I'm happy about. Okay, get your work ready so that you can compare. For number, yesterday's assignment was three questions. The first one was, what is ironic about the 10th juror's opinions of the psychiatrist's testimony and what does it show about him? Elvia gave a, a killer answer um, and I included it below. She said, at first, the 10th juror doesn't believe the psychiatrist's testimony is useful and it is just a bunch of lies, but now, he uses that testimony as evidence and support for his argument. So right there, Elvia named why, what's ironic about that, right? It's a, it's a flip-flop, it's, it's an opposite, an unexpected, somewhat amusing opposite. That's what ir irony is. Now what's it show? Great job answering both questions. A lot of us ignored this last part. What this shows that he can be very stubborn and will use anything to help himself only. This also shows that he can be a hypocrite sometimes and won't admit it. Um, awesome, I totally agree. For number two, I, I shared Mirage's answer. How does the fifth juror's experience growing up in a bad neighborhood raise doubts about the boy's guilt? Um, the most common um, misconception on this answer was that because the fifth juror grew up in a rough neighborhood, he automatically sympathizes with the boy. And that's not necessarily true. Um, we'll see from Mirage's answer that the, the fifth juror's experience has some really clear examples um, of, of how it might change his mind about the crime. Mirage wrote below. The fifth juror's experience growing up in a bad neighborhood raises doubts about the boy's guilt by his knowledge that switchblades are used underhand and using a switchblade underhanded and being shorter than the father wouldn't have made the wound that was found in the father's chest. And the boy uses switchblades a lot, so he would use it correctly. Remember scholars, switchblades are held low and underhanded. The 
father was killed with a high stab wound holding the knife overhanded. But that's not how you hold switchblades, right? Because when you whip a switchblade out, it, it whips out like that. If you were holding it like this, there'd be no way to for the switchblade. You just don't use it like that. Um, awesome. For the third question, we're going to look at my exemplar, which I'm going to pull it up. All right. At the end of this section, the seventh juror changes his vote, but he does so in a strange manner. Remember, he did it in a low voice, and then he stood defeated afterwards. The main, um, the main misconception with this question is people didn't dive into what the evidence showed. They they just kind of summarized about him changing his his him changing his vote, him having baseball tickets. Um, but they didn't look at the evidence from this specific, um, this specific little section and what it shows that he said it in a low voice, what it shows that he stood defeated. So let's take a look at my answer. Again, compare my work to yours. It's so useful when you see um, the work that you did compared to a better example. That's how we learn. That's how we learn in, in sports. You know, you try something. And then you get feedback on it or you try something and then your coach shows you yes and here's how you can do it better right so use this compare yours to mine and what's your takeaway how can you improve how could you have done this assignment better now that you've seen a better comparison and how are you going to do better on today's writing i said the manner in which the seventh juror says this line shows that he's embarrassed by the other jurors calling him out for being a selfish coward all throughout the play, the seventh juror has been declaring the boy's guilt, bad-mouthing those doubting the facts of the case, and complaining about missing his baseball game. These facts demonstrate his selfishness because he cares more about missing his baseball game than carefully deliberating the fate of another human being. However, he seems to change his mind about the boy's guilt when the fifth juror demonstrates how the boy would have been very unlikely to have used the knife the way it was used to kill his father. Now, instead of honestly and bravely announcing that he has changed his mind, I meant to say, I, instead of bravely, instead of honestly and bravely announcing why his mind has changed, he says he'll vote not guilty because he wants to get the trial over with. Jurors from both sides of the argument call him out on this. He sheepishly admits in a low voice, I don't think he's guilty. See how I'm not, now I'm focusing on evidence from this little section. The seventh juror was hoping his excuse about the time would be accepted and he could change his vote without having to admit that he was wrong. But it isn't. And instead, he's humiliated when the other jurors call him out for not having the guts to say how he truly feels, even if it means admitting he was wrong. So I took his body language and him speaking in a low voice to show that he was embarrassed and he was ashamed. All right, let's look at today's assignment. Today is a two-parter. The first question, the, fo the, the kind of star of today's section is, is juror 10, um, and not necessarily for a good reason. We're gonna focus in on the dialogue that juror 10 has in this section the stuff that he says and we're going to dive deep into why did reginald rose write these lines why did he write in juror 10 what theme is he trying to convey so we got to get deep here a quick refresher on theme theme is a, an underlying message or a big idea that the author is trying to get across okay the theme doesn't apply to any particular character. It could apply for anybody. Some examples, when we read The Outsiders, some examples of themes that we learned through Pony Boy's experience and all the characters in The Outsiders, what they went through, um, the, way, the way that they spoke with each other, what we learned through, through their experiences was that people are more alike than they are different. We learned that if you live by the gun, you die by the gun. That, that means if you live a violent life, you're gonna die a violent death. And we learned that through Dally's experience. 
And we learned from how close the outsiders were that family is more than blood, right? Those are messages that the author showed us without naming it specifically, but the things that she wanted us to learn through those experiences. So when you're naming a theme, you need to zoom out to find a theme. And you need to ask yourself, what universal lesson is the author teaching the audience? Remember, universal means applicable to anybody, and it's not just applicable to these characters. This is one of the anchor charts that was used in Miss Jenny's classroom to help you guys write about theme. This example is also from The Outsiders, right? If you were talking, a theme is not just about the characters, that's more evidence. So example of evidence from The Outsiders is this top one, the greasers are like family to each other. A thematic concept is just one word. The example, the concept that we're talking about here is family. Look at the blue section. This is a theme, right? Family is sometimes who you choose, not who you were born to. So the theme is a message, and it's not just about the characters. Again, we learn it from the characters, but the, the theme itself is for anybody. So we're going to read, um, we're going to start to read this section together. and. We're looking for what theme that Rose is showing us or teaching us. It could even be a warning about life, you know, something he wants us to be aware of and look out for. That can also be a theme. Um, and we're going to focus on the stuff that Juror 10 says to get that theme. By the end of the section, there are four jurors who still want to vote guilty. They all have different reasons for wanting to vote guilty. Your job in this section is to get inside their head and speak as if you're like writing their thoughts. I think he's guilty because, right? You're going to complete these statements whenever you feel confident that you can. They all have different reasons too. We'll do one together as we read. Let's pick up on page 72. Remember, this is right after um, they discussed the knife and they called for another vote. And um, they called for another vote, and we find that there are. Um, it's nine to three in favor of not guilty. Tenth juror. I don't understand you people. I mean, all these picky little points you keep bringing up, they don't mean nothing. How can you believe his story? To the eleventh juror. You're an intelligent man. Well, you're not going to tell me you're not. You know the facts of life. Well, for Christ's sake, look at what we're dealing with here. You know what they're like. I mean, that guy, he points at the eighth juror. Over there, well, I don't know what the hell is going on with him. All that talk about psychiatrists. Maybe he ought to go to one. Look, let's talk facts. These people were born to lie. Remember, these people, guys, he's talking about Puerto Ricans, okay? The, the boy is Puerto Rican. These people are born to lie. Now it's the way they are, and no intelligent man is going to tell me otherwise. They don't know what the truth is. Well, take a look at them. They are different. They think different. They act different. Well, for instance, they don't need any big excuse to kill someone. The eighth juror crosses to the, to the washroom door. Well, that's true. Everybody knows it. They get drunk on wine or something cheap like that. Oh, they're very big drinkers. The fifth juror goes into the washroom, slams the door behind him. Smart guy, look at him, for Christ's sakes. What does he mean, slamming the door? And then they're drunk. And all of a sudden, bang! Somebody's lying dead in the gutter. Okay, nobody's blaming them for it. That's how they are, by nature. You know what I mean? Violent. Human life don't mean as much to them as it does to us. The 11th juror arises and crosses to the washroom door. He follows the 5th juror. Where are you going? 
the 11th juror does not reply, goes into the washroom. While you're in there, clean out your ears. Maybe you're here, you're, you'll hear something. Fourth juror rises and moves to the window. Notice everyone's trying to get away from this guy right now. Look, you listen to me now. These people are boozing it up and fighting all the time. And if somebody gets killed, so somebody gets killed. They don't care. Then we don't mean anything to them. They breed like animals. Fathers, mothers don't mean anything. Oh, sure, there are some good things about them. Look, I'm the first one to say that. I've known some who were okay. But that's the exception. Ninth juror. You know you're a sick man. Sick? Ninth juror. Why don't you sit down? Tenth juror. You old son of a bitch. Who the hell are you? The sixth juror moves towards the ninth juror. The twelfth juror steps between the ninth and tenth jurors to the twelfth juror. No. But who the hell is he to talk to me like that? Sick. Look at him. He can hardly stand up. Listen, I'm speaking my piece here, and you're going to listen. The ninth juror moves to the window. Twelfth juror. Maybe if you just quiet it down. Tenth, tenth juror. I will quiet. I will. I will like hell quiet down. There is not one of them. Not one who's any good. Now, do you hear that? Not one. Now, let me lay this out for you, ignorant bastards, to the ninth juror. You, at the window, you're so goddamn smart. We're facing a danger here. Don't you know that? These people are multiplying. That kid on trial, his type, they're multiplying five times as fast as we are. That's the statistic, five times. And they are wild animals. They're against us. They hate us. They want to destroy us. That's right, to the sixth juror. Don't look at me like that. There's a danger. For God's sake, we're living in a dangerous time, and if we don't watch it, if we don't smack them down whenever we can, then they are going to own us. They're going to breed us out of existence, sixth juror. Ah, shut up! I'll stop there. You can kind of pick up on... Um, this is a very, very, very hateful, racist, his, his beliefs come out, right? So for number one, you need to get deep. Don't just say what the dialogue was. We know it was racist, right? Why did Reginald Rose write this character? Why did he write him saying these words? What's he trying to teach us or show us, right? Not just show us about the 10th juror. What's he trying to sh show us about the world, about people in general? Make sure that your theme is universal. It's not just talking about the 10th juror. What does he represent? What is, what is, what is he teaching us about life in general? Or maybe even just in America, okay? For the third part, you need to complete these phrases. And I'll do, um, I'll do, I'll show you how to do the first one, right? You can use thinking that you know from other sections. So we know that the fourth juror is the guy who's really smart. He's the guy who named all of the facts of why he thinks that um, the boy is guilty. He's the only one when arguing with the eighth juror that he's able to argue with facts from the case and not his own personal feelings. So if you're the fourth, fourth juror, what are you thinking? He'd be thinking... I think he's guilty. Again, it says, write a statement as each door to explain their thinking. I think he's guilty because the fourth juror would say, there are so many facts against, there are so many convincing facts and testimonies against him, right? The fourth juror really does believe that he, he, he thinks the facts show that he did it, okay? So what do we know about the third juror? Why is he voting that the boy is guilty? We clearly know why the 10th juror, I think he's guilty because what would the 10th juror say? 
And the 12th juror is going to flip-flop his vote. Just letting you know, he's going to flip-flop his vote in this section. If you were the 12th juror, he's going to say, I think he's guilty because just complete each of these statements. All right? Um, you're going to continue reading until page 72 with the third juror saying, I apologize on my knees. Come on, let's get out from under this thing. All right? So you got a few more pages to go. I can't wait to say you're thinking. See, so you're thinking again. Make sure your theme. It, it's not just breaking down who the tenth juror is as a person. You can do that for a little bit, but you need to get to the bigger lesson. What is Rose teaching us, showing us, or warning us about by including the tenth juror and uh, people like him? All right. I can't wait to see your excellent thinking. Make sure you get your thirty minutes of Lexi logged in, and I will see you guys tomorrow.